All right. Thank you, everyone, for having us um, to speak to you all. Today, I'm joined with two colleagues, and we'll introduce ourselves in just a second. But today, we're going to speak about how business agility fueled development of Lucid Spark. And we'll give you a little bit of story behind Lucid Spark and really these principles, more importantly, about business agility. But first, to kind of talk about who we are, my name is Jerem uh, Chung. I'm a senior director of product at Lucid. And um, overall, I, I'm like over some product managers that support Lucid Spark and other Lucid in initiatives around user engagement, things like that. I have a weird background. I used to be a scientist turned product manager, and um, I love to mountain bike, to box, paste, bake pastries. But most importantly, that cute picture of me and my family, we are family adventurers. I am also joined with my good friend, Lindsay Martin, um, who will introduce herself. Hi, I'm Lindsay, uh, Director of User Experience with Lucid. Um, I lead the team of designers who are conjuring magic for our visual collaboration suite. Um, I have a background in design research, um, and I have applied that across a range of industries. And uh, I enjoy crossword solving and getting outside with my dogs, who are also pictured here. So cute. <laughs> And Andy. Yeah, I'm a senior director of engineering at Lucid. Um, I lead the Lucid Spark engineering team as well as some other groups across our organization. Um, I have a degree in computer science and math uh, that I received from Northwestern and Brigham Young University. I, I'm a father of two and I've captured all of my favorite things in Lego form uh, in this photo here. Uh, so love Lego, love a bunch of other things uh, associated with that. and building things, video games, you know, all that stuff's fun. Love it. Love it. So today we're going to talk about uh, business agility. And specifically, we're going to go through the lens of how Lucid employed business agility strategies to launch our virtual whiteboard, um, Lucid Spark. But first, we want to level set on how we're defining business agility. So what is it? So according to the Agile Business Consortium, they define business agility as agility in an organization's culture, leadership, strategy, and governance that adds value to all stakeholders who operate in uncertain, complex, and ambiguous environments. All those words basically mean to say is like there are frameworks and there's a culture behind um, an organization that leads to agility, that we can navigate whatever may be thrown into your path, whether it be a pandemic, a war, right, changing markets, whatever it may be, these frameworks that we hope to outline today around business agility will really help your business or your team or whoever it may be, really be more agile to kind of make the decisions you need to make. So why should you implement business agility? Um, really want to quickly run through these core different whys. First, it improves cross-collaboration across your organization. Who doesn't want that? Second, it keeps products and future products really competitive, right? Because you can be adaptable with it. Third, aligns all teams to a shared larger vision. You'll hear themes of that really resonate throughout the, work, the presentation of why that is so important too. And last, it helps teams bring features and products to market very quickly. So the framework that we're going to go over today is really bucketed into four main groups. First of all, customer centricity, why that's important to agility. Second, rapid decision making. Third, adaptivity and flexibility. And fourth, continuous delivery. And these four business strategies really were employed throughout the process to make um, the development and launch of Lucid Spark highly successful. But first, let's kind of hear a little bit about the origins of Lucid Spark from our friend Lindsay. Yeah. So let's travel back in time. Uh, summer 2020, uh, the world changed pretty abruptly overnight. We entered a global pandemic. And um, one outcome of that was that a lot of people who were used to working together in offices, on teams, suddenly were uh, trying to collaborate from their bedrooms and their kitchens and their dining rooms and their backyards and their closets. Um, and, and we collectively had to um, adopt and adapt to a new way of working. Um, and the way that that played out at Lucid um, was that we there was an urgent market need like it needs surfaced um for new technology solutions that could not only replicate but improve in-person uh 
collaboration and creativity in a virtual setting. So um, we used to gather around whiteboards and we now needed a proxy for that uh, to use from our closets and bedrooms and kitchens and dining rooms. Um, so online whiteboarding solutions certainly existed two years ago. And in fact, um, we had a product called Lucid Chart that certainly existed two years ago. Um, but we saw an opportunity to apply the strengths of our visual collaboration platform to build an innovative solution that could better enable distributed teams to brainstorm together than seamlessly move from ideation to planning. So go from really ambiguous to really concrete. Uh, and the teams at Lucid set an ambitious goal. So again, this was an abrupt market need, like everything changed overnight. We set an ambitious goal to build and launch Lucid Spark in less than six months. Um, so while doing so, uh, we were also adapting to a fully remote way of working. Um, and that was really challenging in a lot of ways. And the agility strategies that we employed allowed us to build and launch a product offering that met the unique challenges of our that our customers were facing um, while adapting to new ways of working ourselves. So fast forward to today, uh, we picked up a lot of learnings along the way, both in terms of uh, product development, uh, as well as our, our customers and like our approach to design, um, but also how our teams work to remain extremely agile and flexible as we continue to grow the Lucid Visual Collaboration Suite. Awesome. It was so meta that we were building a solution for hybrid work when we were hybrid working and figuring it out ourselves. It was well, wild. That's right. It wasn't even hybrid. It was, it was full remote. That's what it was. <laughs> awesome. Well, part of this, let's start, Lindsay, with customer centricity. You and your teams really dove into this and the importance of why, um, how we created Lucid Spark was because of this. Yeah. I mean, customer centricity is at the heart of everything we do. Uh, our UX designers, our product managers, our chief product officer um, speak to a minimum of one customer per week, and oftentimes it's a lot more. Um, and we were able to succeed in this incredibly uh, ambitious timeline because we were customer centric, because we knew already how this product served our customers. We knew, and we knew already how our current offerings um, were not quite meeting their changing needs. Um, so it, it, was, uh, it was quite easy uh, for us to make the pivot and quite easy to, um, to get the buy-in that we needed from the people who we were asking to make this change because they also are engaging with our customers every day right? Or every week, like, uh, and they also had heard these same pains and knew exactly what we needed to do to be successful. Um, specifically, customer centricity became really important during uh, the development of Lucid Spark. We had a lot of constraints that we were working under, time being a huge one. Um, but also, um, it was a completely um, closed development process. So we were not um, speaking publicly about what we were doing, everything had to remain very confidential. Um, and so that made it difficult for us to um, do traditional user testing uh, on our product. And so the foundational understanding that we had about customers and the way that they engage with our product and the context in which we work um, really was a boon to the design team as they had to make decisions very quickly without all of the data that they're used to gathering um, for each of those decisions. So customer centricity uh, is a mindset that keeps our customers front and center. Um, and it's something that we really embrace and believe in at Lucid. Um, so the next strategy uh, we wanna cover is rapid decision-making. Um, Jerem, how did you see us employ this strategy during the development of Lucid Spark? Oh man, like with rapid decision-making, I mean, we had less than six months, we were making decisions quickly felt like literally every second sometimes. Every meeting, there was a new decision. And really, when we think about rapid decision-making, it is this collaborative, iterative, and transparent process to really make sure that these decisions are not only fast, but also sustainable and are the right decisions. And really important to keep these teams moving against these really, really, really tight timelines. Um, 
we didn't want any blockers, any like whether they be what button color should this be or like how are we doing pricing and packaging, right? We didn't want any blockers. We had to go quickly and get that information and that data to really make those decisions. But overall, once again, we had these frameworks about empowering teams um, and using these frameworks right, right, likewise to make these decisions quickly with these strategies that really helped propel us forward. So I'll give you some examples of some that we employed on this rapid decision-making. Uh, first is like the importance of just conveying and emphasizing this vision and these principles. I remember Lindsay and her team having design principles really established early on so that when we went down the line and had to be like, okay, do we do this, which is more clicks or this, which is less it's like, okay, what do the principles say? What's the why? What's what the customer needs, right? Or even thinking high level. When we think about, you know, Lindsay mentioned going from idea to planning as far as like how we think about Lucid Spark. This vision was really important that we make sure we can cover this customer journey. And if there's something outside of that customer journey, we should ask ourselves, why? Is this the most important thing we need to work on? Always, once again, going back again and again and again towards this vision really helped us make sure that um, we were focused. Um, but more importantly, also removing this noise, right? That when there are things that we decided that were not part of our vision or part of that focus, we could actually kind of remove it out of the way, right? Put it in a parking lot. We could kind of talk about it later. But what was important too with this, with having a vision is actually sharing that vision. It was fine if I knew the vision, right? But it's better if everyone else knows it. We can make more decisions um, concurrently, independently, and that alignment is a lot quicker too. So when we think about rapid decision making, really that foundation of the vision becomes by which we can is a platform to make us go faster, right? But not only is it kind of our vision as directors or individuals as PMs, but even as a whole company, the CPO and the other executives were absolutely essential and crucial in this process. That we were communicating a lot with them in these working sessions together, right? In these executive alignment to sessions together, not only to make sure that we were on the right path, but likewise that they saw that the path forward was what they were also hoping for. There's a lot of back and forth, but through that kind of really transparent conversations, communications, it really kind of helped us make sure that we we're making decisions quickly. One other framework that we loved that it happened pretty early on, it was actually Lindsay who was like, actually, we need, we need to have a really simple framework to help teams know now, next, or later. And that just became our adage, now, next, or later. And it was funny because once again, it was a little meta. We were using one of our early prototypes for Lucid Spark, right? Helping our teams come together. And whenever there's a decision or just like something for a roadmap, we'd have to take a step back and say, okay, is this a now? We need it absolutely this sprint or this month, or is it next? Next month we can get to this. Or do we need this now because it affects the next, right? There's a dependency. Or is this later? Is this even after launch? Is this next year, right? When it comes to six month deadlines, you have to be very, very um, rigorous and almost cutthroat, you know, it's not the best word, but make sure that you are trimming the fat to make sure you are doing the now when you have to do now and the later and the next can be in those buckets. But whenever we made those decisions, once again, we communicated about them, we aligned them to the vision and really just talked about the why of why we we're cutting things down. But naturally, as part of this, when we think about, you know, making these rapid decisions, what the downstream repercussions of that would, of course, be on the teams. How do they become adaptable and flexible? How do they actually think about these decisions and are brought in? So I'm going to turn it over to Andy to talk about this. Yeah, no, making sure the teams adapt, uh, you know, has adaptivity and flexibility is an important part of being able to respond to these kinds of changes. And really, it's all about practicing on a regular basis. Uh, so at Lucid, we follow agile practices, specifically Scrum methodology. And that gives everyone this opportunity on a regular cadence to, you know, engineers are able to dive deep and along with everyone else on the team, get work done over a period of time and then kind of surface, come up for air and look around, see what has changed and then dive back in and work uh, and focus for another couple of weeks. Um, and so like, if you're following those kinds of practices, then you're already designed around, you know, having flexibility as new priorities come up. And now these pivots come along, but it doesn't happen too often. Uh, but when it does happen, you're ready for it and you can change. Uh, but sometimes with a, the huge pivot like this one was where we were completely changing what people were working on to build a whole new product, 
Um, and especially on a distributed team, it requires a lot of communication to make sure you have a, that alignment early on. Uh, Jeremy, I still remember the meetings we were in early on, trying to make sure we had that alignment. <laughs> Those paid off huge dividends in the long run. Oh my gosh, they, they did. And um, when we think about the order, I mean, I think something that we started productionalizing too, Andy, we started thinking about what are the communication patterns we have to establish, who needs to know what and when. And really, when it was a, when we came back to the company, right, and said, hey, we're doing Lucid Spark and we're launching in six months, I mean, the company could easily be like, oh my gosh, what are we doing? Is this a right decision, right? Have we made this decision too quickly? <laughs> um, and that's kind of where the alignment comes on. And it's important, once again, kind of going back to that vision of letting everyone understand the why, understand why we are pivoting why it's happening, why it's important. And even some of the data that we had seen, right? Like, hey, we just entered a pandemic. This is a great opportunity. And like, here's how we see work evolving in X, Y, Z. And like, this is how we think it's not just a, a, a two month type of remote work thing. This is why it might go on forever. And here's why the market is nice, right? All those, although sometimes to some of us, it feels like extra details, for those that are in the weeds, those extra details are actually really valuable. And what's the worst? They ignore some of it, right? And But really what's more important is that they're bought in. It's like, okay, this is a thoughtful decision, even if I don't understand everything. Or this is, yeah, these are similar questions that I would have myself. Um, the next thing, of course, if you're on this team to be scared of is like, wait, six months? Are we crazy? Well, we were a little bit crazy, but it was important and we did it. <laughs> Everyone nods like, yeah, it was crazy. Um, but really creating these clear expectations on effort and timing was so essential to make sure that no one felt like they were underwater or over their head that here's the expectations but even then like our executive team they weren't like holding us with a dagger right it was more like hey here's like what we think can we do this how can we do this and anytime there was a pivot or something that we found out communicating that back up about like hey executives we had to be a little more adaptable and flexible on this aspect really created trust between the whole group but also allowed us to make sure that there was breathing room and we could actually get this work done. This last one is um, when asking these people, it's important to make it asking and make it a choice and not necessarily fully tops down. Um, a lot of engineers were like, oh yeah, I want to do this. Like, get me on this. I want to like prove my career. I'm young and hungry, right? Where there's others where it wasn't the right time in their life to do that. And that's okay, right? In order to be adaptable and flexible, you have to recognize the limitations and the capabilities of your team to move forward. So speaking of which, you know, Andy, there were so, there were, there was a good amount of engineers that were caught in this exact nexus of having to get the work done and realizing these expectations. How did you make sure that your engineers really got home the vision and the objective and made, made it way forward? Yeah, no, it's, I think it's so easy uh, for anyone on a team, but I think in particular engineers to get so caught up in the details of the work and, you know, the everyday things that they're taking care of and trying to crunch through that they kind of forget about the why, what's the high level objective. Um, and like in order to really understand that or like to to make use of that, it's something you just have to repeat frequently and talk about on a regular cadence. Like, OK, here's what we're doing and here's why we're doing it. This is what we're trying to get to. Um, and like it's really important for engineers to understand that because a small change in requirements can actually have huge repercussions uh, for what's actually in the product. So if an engineer doesn't understand why those changes are important or what's going on, um, you can get a lot of pushback and a lot of concerns. But if someone understands it like, oh, okay, this is what we were thinking and this is what we learned. And now this is why we're adjusting. It's a lot easier to accept that and move forward. Um, beyond that, if, if engineers really understand what the motivation is and what we're trying to accomplish, you can often see phenomenal solutions come from engineers that save just a ton of time and still meet customer needs really well. I know there were multiple times where this happened, uh, where you know designers presented a design that was great, it was amazing, and engineers said, "Well, if we just tweak it a little bit here, you know, this will save us, you know, two weeks worth of effort to build out this whole new system," and that was an amazing thing to see. Um, and you don't get that if engineers are so focused on the details 
of the everyday work that they don't surface and try and understand what they're what they're accomplishing overall. Um, so including engineering leads in those conversations early on can really create a lot of value, making sure they're aware and aligned. It all starts at the top. Um, and with all this, like if if engineers know that you're testing something or just like experimenting, then that's an opportunity to save a lot of time and you know, cut corners, not build something fully production ready, but still get it out to customers and try out some new things without committing completely. Love it. Um, and so yeah, along those same lines, uh, in terms of like just moving quickly, uh, continuous delivery was huge for us. Um, continuous delivery is really just about move, removing all of the barriers uh, to get solutions out to customers as quickly as possible. You know, in a sustainable way. That's a really important <laughs> point here. Uh, so for Lucid, this was not a sudden thing. Um, it took us about three years of pretty consistent effort to get to a point where our entire system, you know, today is, uh, you know, continuously integrated and continuously deployed. Um, and it wasn't like a big thing that we pushed out all at once. We took a very incremental approach. Um, and we built out infrastructure to be able to release things on a regular cadence. And um, the other important part was testing. But like we just took a step-by-step -step approach and prioritized, okay, what are the big pieces that are impacting customers the most? Where can we see the biggest improvements and value? And then we worked through till we got to maybe some of the smaller systems that, you know, maybe they don't change as often. And so it's not as critical that we have that continuous delivery piece. Um, but like I said, testing was a huge part of the initiative. Um, if you're not going to have any kind of manual checks ahead of deploying, uh, you really have to make sure you're dialed in and things are working well. So without automated testing, there's just not a lot of hope of getting that really fast feedback loop that you need. Um, so we organized a whole uh, team effort. Uh, we had lots of testing in place already. Uh, but there are areas where there is manual testing still going on. And so to remove all those so we could go to continuous deployment, uh, we created a giant list of all the tests we needed to create, and then we assigned those out to teams. And by assigned out, I mean we kind of just threw the list out there and said, hey, everyone, take a couple of these and we'll be able to get it all done. Uh, but we built this huge dashboard that had kind of where we were on the testing, and we had these drawings that people could get entered into by completing extra tests. We even had a, a certain director dancing around uh, with a big Ewok head on. I was really random and made it a ton of fun for people. So um, it was definitely an investment. We took a lot of time doing it, but we made it fun. And at the end of the day, it like really helped our customers because now we can get something out to customers often the same day uh, that we you know, merge the code, it goes out to customers. We can even sometimes iterate multiple times, uh, you know, in the same week on something to really get some details and clarity on what we need from customers. Um, but really with all this, like it wouldn't have helped us had we not invested early. And that's really the, the critical thing here uh, with all of these things. I think we've talked a lot about these different principles, right? Especially in the development of Lucid Spark. A lot of it came from our investment early, like continuous delivery, three years of investment, but it was worthwhile. So when we talk to these principles of customer centricity, rapid decision-making, adaptive adaptivity and flexibility, as well as continuous delivery, we talk about it very much kind of from a company level. Andy and Lindsay, as you kind of think about this for your own teams, how do you apply these business agility techniques um, in your domains? Yeah, I think um, the principle that we adhere to um, that we uh, like learn through this process and have reflected on uh, since is that you are going to stay competitive if you have the agility to respond to changes in the market quickly. Um, and a customer centric organization is an organization that can recognize when those shifts are happening and respond appropriately to them. Yeah, totally, totally. And I, I think like the other part is if you're if you're going to ask people to pivot quickly and to change their priorities, you really have to help them understand and you know rely on a why to really win their hearts and minds. Uh, it's critical to develop a strong shared vision that you can point to. Uh, it helps people feel like pivots are recalibrations and not whims. 
That's awesome. Well, um, I love those principles. And once again, kind of as a reminder, business agility requires time. It requires an investment and you can't just all of a sudden have it, right? It become, it's a change of culture. So what we did when we launched Lucid Spark really leveraged a lot of what Lucid had done for years across the org, org to really create this type of agility from decisions, right? To how we think about customers all the way to even how we um, ship code, for instance. But our greatest recommendation, so thanks for having us. Our recommendation to you all today is that you start now, start implementing these principles of business agility because the investment is well worth it for when you need it. Thank you so much. Cheers. Thank you.